Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. It was all changed this week in the financial markets, with both bond and equity prices rallying strongly on the back of the latest meetings of central banks and some important data coming out of the U.S., The Federal Reserve in the US, the Bank of England over here, and the European Central Bank have all had meetings recently at which they decided not to increase interest rates further, helping to reinforce the market's convictions that the peak of interest rates may indeed now have been reached. The latest job creation data coming out of the US was also capable of being interpreted in the same way, since it showed a significant decline in the rate of job increases in the US economy. And there was also a downward revision in the figures released earlier for the month of August. The bond market certainly reacted positively to the implication that uh, peak interest rates may indeed be here, though the Federal Reserve and the other central banks were at pains to say that they were not yet thinking about any interest rate cuts, which the markets are now expecting to take place by the middle of next year. We'll have to wait and see about that, since uh, expectations have been repeatedly confounded as far as interest rate expectations are concerned. But the bond markets weren't thinking much about that. We saw yields decline significantly uh, across all maturities. Uh, In the US, the 30 and the 10-year Treasury both saw their yields decline by something in the order of 30 basis points, 0.3%, which is a significant move in bond market terms. And as a result, bond prices moved up significantly, particularly at the longer end of the curve. In the UK, for example, we saw that uh, gilts were up across the board. Only one issue has not uh, seen a price rise this week. And some of the longer dated gilts saw their prices increase by 7%. Again, another significant move in bond market terms. If you look at the gilts market across the whole maturity spectrum, there are now 10 gilts which are uh, yielding less than 4.2% and none are now yielding more than 5%. So that again is a sign that the regime may indeed have changed for good. Uh, Meanwhile, we saw the gold price was flat over the week more or less and oil prices were slightly weaker. Uh, The good news for investment trust shareholders is, of course, that the derating has been largely driven by rising bond yields uh, and any change in the outlook for bonds is bound to have an impact on share prices. And that is indeed what we saw this week, particularly in the alternative assets sector. The investment trust index, which comprises between 180 and 190 of the stocks in the FTSE All Share Index, was up on the week 3.6%, a welcome recovery from recent month's performance. And the average discount narrowed a little. 15 investment trusts uh, saw their share prices increase by more than 10%, led by Urban Logistics, a 19.7% gain on the week, and other names including Chrysalis, Target Healthcare, DGI9 Infrastructure, Tritax Big Box and TR Property, all of those up by more than 14%. Property sector being perhaps the most striking gainer from this week's uh, change in expectations for interest rates. Also some notable gains for the core infrastructure trusts and some of the smaller company trusts were also up between 5 and 8%. At the other end of the scale, there were still some uh, losers on the week. In fact, uh, the gainers outnumbered losers by around nearly five to one. But there were a number of trusts which saw their share prices decline. And they included some of the early stage growth capital trusts such as Seraphim Space, RTW Biotech, Rockwood, the smaller companies trust, Taylor Maritime, Hydrogen One and Hypnosis Songs Fund. Much in the news recently was also down slightly this week as investors continued to digest the possible permutations of the future for that particular trust following its failed continuation vote. So a week of contrasting fortunes for a number of investment trusts, but also a significant amount of news coming out of the sector this week. 
which I shall be discussing later with Nick Greenwood, manager of MIGO Opportunities Trust, ticker M-I-G-O, where the uh, management contract is shortly to be migrated from Premier Mighton to Asset Value Investors. And Nick Greenwood will be making a similar move, moving to join the uh, Asset Value Investors stable before the end of the year. Uh, My Opportunities Trust, I probably don't need to remind you, is a trust that specialises in looking to exploit special situations and interesting discount opportunities in the investment trust sector. And therefore, one of our uh, regular guests who has a view across the entire investment trust space. So more from him shortly. Turning to the main news this week, and there has been, as I say, a series of significant and interesting announcements this week. Let's start with an update on Thomas Lloyd Energy Impact, ticker T-L-E-I, which is no longer going to be called Thomas Lloyd Energy Impact. It has changed its name to Asian Energy Impact Trust, and its ticker is going to change from T-L-E-I to A-E-I-P for the sterling share class, at least. The dollar share class is A-E-I-T now. The news from this one is that Octopus, which manages a well-known renewable energy trust, Octopus Renewables, has been appointed as a temporary manager while the board seeks to sort out the mess at its uh, big solar project in India, which has caused its shares to be suspended for some time. The announcement said that Octopus have conducted a preliminary analysis of the project, the RUMS project as it's known, and concurs with the board's view that the net present value in other words, whether the returns from this project will be positive or negative, they say it's materially more negative than the estimate in the base case scenario that was uh, estimated before, which was £13 million in sterling. That was based on a number of assumptions which may not now be met. Both the board and Octopus believe that, quote, there is a reasonable likelihood of construction not being fully completed on time. So what this means for the timetable for resuming a listing for this one is not entirely clear yet. But shareholders will be hoping for some positive news before too long. And in particular, whether this decision to go ahead with this project, despite the fact that it may well lose money, is still the best course forward for the trust. Also in the news again this week was uh, DGI 9 infrastructure, ticket DGI 9 where the board, you'll recall, has been canvassing the idea of selling its largest holding, a business called Vern Global. But uh, this has prompted a reaction from a group of shareholders uh, representing over 20% of the share capital and led by uh, Aqua Ventures, which is another company that DGI9 has invested in. They have told the board that they fear that the sale of Vern Global would foreclose, in other words, rule out the possibility of a sale of the trust itself as a whole, and risk value destruction by stranding the company's other assets. In return, the board of DGI9 said they'd uh, noticed the announcement from uh, Aquaventures and had responded by saying that its judgment continues to be that prioritising a sale of 100% of Vern Global is in the best interest of shareholders because it provides the best opportunity to deleverage and improve cash flow. The problem in this case having arisen because the board's commitments to funding its assets exceeds its capability with the current state of its balance sheet. The board also said that it thought that uh, a strategic review, which is what uh, Aqua Ventures wanted, would be a distraction and risk disruption to the sale process for Vern Global. So the issue here is whether or not their shareholders collectively are going to be happy with the proposal that the board is putting forward. We'll find that out in due course. On a slightly different tack, we heard from RTW Biotech Opportunities, ticker RTW, which is a trust that invests mostly in biotech early stage companies. It's more towards the venture capital end of the spectrum in private equity terms. Here it announced that RTW is far from selling assets, is actually agreed terms with another company called Arix Bioscience for an all share acquisition of Arix, which would have the effect of growing the market capitalization and the asset base of this particular trust. This would be affected by a scheme of reconstruction involving the winding up of Arix, but is conditional on regulatory and shareholder approval. If it does get that, the transaction is expected to complete in the first quarter of next year year. If the deal does go through, then it will create a larger vehicle with combined assets of $450 million, which compares to the current market capitalization of RTW, uh, which is around $200 million. Uh, but it does trade on a discount of around 25%. 
So that would be a significant increase in size, which would have the effect, obviously, of reducing the ongoing charges ratio. And RTW estimates that the deal would lead to an expected NAV accretion of low single digits. Next, we can discuss the news from Troy Income and Growth Trust, where the board has announced that it's currently exploring possible options for a combination with another investment trust, which would be affected by a scheme of reconstruction. This trust has a market cap of around 153 million, and though it has an active discount control policy, which means that its discount remains in low single digits, it's been effective, but it has had the effect of shrinking the size of the trust. And furthermore, the amount of reserves that this trust has in order to continue its policy of buybacks, the amount of it is now near depletion, and the fund is close to using up all its buyback authority. So what's going to happen here is that the board has suspended the discount control policy until the details regarding the proposed merger with this other party, we don't know who it is yet, will be announced by the end of November. Though the board says there's no guarantee that any scheme will in fact be agreed. So more consolidation there. More news too from Biopharma Credit, ticker BPCR and BPCP. This is a debt trust that uh, lends money to biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies. The board here has announced that a continuation resolution has been triggered because at the end of October 2023, the discount at which this particular trust has traded has been wider than 10% over the previous 12 months, which is the trigger for a continuation vote being required. This will be an interesting one. It will be uh, voted on at a general meeting uh, before the end of the year. And the board says that it will be recommending that all shareholders vote in favour of continuation. And a second continuation resolution will be presented at the AGM in 2025, assuming that the first one passes, of course. Now, this one is interesting because uh, Biopharma Credit has seen its discount widen significantly since the start of the year. It's currently trading at around a 20% discount, which reflects uncertainty over the outlook for a number of its holdings, but particularly its largest holding, uh, which consists of loans to a company called Lumira DX, uh, which accounts for more than 10% of the total portfolio. Now, this particular loan to Lumira DX has been troubled. Uh, It's been amended several times as the company has been unable to meet its uh, requirements under the lending agreements that it has. But there has been some significant developments there at the company recently, including that the managers, the CEO and chairman, the chief technical officer and the chief scientist of Lumira DX have resigned. So in other words, the entire uh, top management of the company has resigned. And they say that is in order to avoid potential conflicts of interest, which I think the market has interpreted meaning that there's going to be a transaction in this particular company, either will be sold or, or wound up. Uh, We don't know which it is, but it obviously has run into uh, financial difficulties. Uh, It is a signal that this uh, particular problem issue is approaching its end game. But the question, of course, is whether or not this continuation vote will actually happen before the situation at uh, Lumira DX has been finally sorted out. Obviously, it will be difficult for shareholders to vote in a continuation if they don't know exactly what's happening to the largest investment in the portfolio. The shares in this one were largely unchanged on the news. We uh, heard further news from US Solar, ticker USF, which is one of the smaller renewable energy infrastructure trusts, and one which has therefore been considering its future, having already announced that it's received no proposals worth considering uh, for the sale of its assets or the company as a whole. The board says it's going to be publishing a circular Uh, advising shareholders of the proposed changes to the fund's investment policies and providing notice of general meeting to approve those changes. These changes are relatively minor. They will allow uh, the trust to invest more in late stage development assets and will also remove the minimum power price contract length which the trust is able to enter into. If shareholders do not approve the investment policy changes, then the Amber Infrastructure Group, which has been proposed by the board as the successor investment manager to the previous incumbent, will not be appointed. But uh, that will therefore depend on the outcome of the vote. Elsewhere, we heard that uh, Roundhill Music, ticker RHM, has now delisted. It's no longer possible to trade in these shares. That happened this week, and that followed the Guernsey Court sanctioning the scheme 
by which the investment trust will be acquired by an American company called Concord. We also heard from RM Infrastructure Income, ticker RMII. Again, another relatively small investment trust, around 80 million in market cap, where the board says it expects to publish its shareholder circular by the end of November, uh, which will convene a general meeting and seek approval from shareholders for the managed wind down of this particular trust, as previously announced. Yet again, more examples of the consolidation that has been running through the sector as a result of the uh, significant derating of the sector over the last two years. Finally, in this section, we heard from Capital Gearing Trust, ticker CGT, the 1.1 billion market cap absolute return or defensive trust, you call it what you will, which is well known to listeners of the podcast and is particularly well known for its zero discount control policy which commits it to uh, buying back shares uh, whenever the trust's shares move to a discount. The trust has been very active on this score in the last few months. It's repurchased uh, £62 million worth of shares over the last three months and £140 million year to date, as it has consistently traded below par for a significant part of the period. As a result, it has temporarily run into the limit of its reserves that it can dedicate to buying back shares. It has applied for permission, which you have to do in these cases, for approval from the courts to reclassify its share premium account uh, as a distributable reserve and therefore become a reserve that it can use for the purpose of share buybacks. What that implies is that the rate of share buybacks that this trust will be doing over the next few weeks until it gets that approval will be restricted, and therefore that might lead to some more discount volatility in the short term. Turning to results, we've had four notable annual results reported this week, headed by Bailey Gifford Japan, ticker BGFD, which reported annual results for the year to the 31st of August, which saw it reduce an NEV total return of minus 5.4% compared to the Topics Japanese Equity Market Index total return of plus 6.7%, so some 12% of underperformance there. This trust has also been buying back shares at 850,000 shares in this particular period at a cost of 6.4 million. It attributed the underperformance to its bias towards smaller companies and growth stocks, both of which have been out of favour in recent months. There are results too from Asia Dragon, ticker ADN, also for the 12 months to 31st of August. Uh, NAV total return minus 16.7% versus an 8.4% uh, decline in the benchmark. So not a good period for this particular trust, uh, which also saw its discount widen. The board here said that uh, most of the underperformance was driven by its exposure to China, which has been notably weak this year. You'll recall that it's been proposed that this trust will soon combine with Aberdeen New Dawn, another trust managed by the same investment management house, Aberdeen, subject to approval by shareholders in the coming week. They're obviously hoping that the combination will create a larger and more viable trust. But the question obviously will be there's a lot to do to improve performance in this particular one. And results two from Henderson International Income, again for the same period. Ticker H-I-N-T, where the NAV total return here was slightly better, 0.8% over the year with debt at par value, uh, which compares with 2.3% for the benchmark that it uses, which has been changed. It's now the MSCI All Countries World Index XUK High Dividend Yield Index Sterling Adjusted. A bit of a mouthful there. Anyway, so this is mild underperformance for this one. Uh, which also faces a continuation vote. That's coming up in December. And it'll be interesting to see how that one fares when it comes up for shareholders. Approval to continue. And finally, in terms of annual results, we heard from Schroeder BSC British Opportunities Trust. This one reporting its annual results for the period to 30th of June this year. It reported NAV total return of plus 0.8% over the period. This is an early stage mixed private and public equity vehicle that has uh, struggled to gain traction since it was launched a couple of years ago. But uh, as the company noted, it has at least delivered a positive NAV total return of 8.6% since it came to the market in December 2020. There were also a significant number of updates from alternative asset trusts this week, mostly third quarter NAV announcements 
and you can find a full list of these on the Moneymakers Circle website. As normal, together with our list of the most significant movers in share price, NAV, and discount terms this week, and there have been quite a few, so that's well worth taking a look at this week, as I've said, been a very positive week for a number of investment trusts and some big movements in both discounts and share prices. Our profile this week is of the Brunner Investment Trust, and that'll be followed in uh, coming weeks by profiles of Balanced Commercial Property Trust, ticker BCPT, and uh, Nippon Active Value, ticker NAVF, the Japanese trust, which is consolidating in that sector by merging with two other Japanese trusts. I will also be looking back at the extent to which this week's revival in alternative assets has had a positive impact on the trust that I mentioned a couple of months ago as being worth considering when and if peak interest rates have finally arrived. Well, this is the week where that hypothesis is certainly proving to have some value. So it's been quite an exciting week in the investment trust sector. A lot of movement picking up on bond yields changing uh, direction this week. So my first question to Nick Greenwood was, what does he make of the most recent uh, developments in the markets? They don't entirely come as a surprise to you, I think. No, I think, you know, there's been a lot of fear around. And uh, once you get a little bit of fear, that uh, depresses prices. And I think the expectations may be that interest rates have peaked. We've discussed this before, but it does show what a difference it would make to ratings and valuations. Right. So a lot of things which are deemed to be interest rate sensitive, mm. like property and uh, infrastructure. Mm. and Exactly those two. Yeah. Yeah. They sort of bounced up nicely on Thursday after the latest announcements from central banks. So, well, if it does stay the same, do you have a view about whether it's going to sort of stay at this high level, higher for longer? Or do you think we're going to go back down again? And maybe if we run into a risk of recession or some such, do you have a view on that? I think I'm perhaps more cynical and perhaps a little bit more cautious. I think, you know, we haven't completely dismissed the possibility that interest rates and guilt yields are rising because we and other countries like the US are borrowing too much and the lenders are maybe sort of having second faults at some point. In that scenario, given how much the governments have been spending, your debt service goes up, interest rates go up, and that's not a great scenario. Not saying that's definitely the way we see it, but uh, we can't dismiss that risk yet. So uh, it does mean I stay a little bit cautious. But then there's lots of individual situations that are fascinating and uh, rewarding even in that kind of environment. Well, let's talk about some of those then. Why don't we start in the alternatives? Because obviously that's been in the eye of the storm, if you like, in terms of discount widening as interest rates have risen and may now be pausing. So in general terms, do you think there are things there which are, say, attractive, even if interest rates stay where they are? Obviously, they might be affected if interest rates go up again, as you say. But in general terms, looking at the sectors of property, infrastructure and so on, do you think that, if you like, the discounts have been overdone anyway? I think they have in alternatives, and that's partly because there's an oversupply situation. A lot of these trusts were launched to sort of solve yield starvation, you know, to offer advisors a way of getting their clients an income at a time when deposit rates were virtually zero. So roll the clock onto where we are today, you can get comfortably over 5% on a gilt. So that undermines the demand for, say, an infrastructure fund yielding 5%. Maybe that has to yield 7 or 8, and that's quite a steep fall in the capital value. And relative to what you can sell the underlying assets for, those share prices look overdone to the downside. Well, let's talk about one or two individual names then within these sectors. Let's start with um, Aquila European Renewables. They made an announcement this week. I think you are an investor in this one, I believe. What do you make of uh, what they had to say this week? They didn't say that much, actually. The NAV had come back a little bit. I mean, I think what we're seeing in all sorts of areas is power prices declining. So it's good that there wasn't uh, too much bad news along with the numbers. They've upped their um, discount rate, which is good because interest rates have risen and uh, there are a number of trusts that have kept their discount rates on the face of it rather on to the small side. I mean, here, the trust is, is good at what it does. It's managed out of Hamburg. Uh, the team have got about 15 billion to run and this trust is small. You know, It's probably in the region of, say, 300 million. So it's never going to get a following from the wealth managers. And if you want, you know, there are ways of marketing to the self-directed investor. There are ways of marketing yourself to smaller wealth managers who are still very keen to buy investment trusts. But, you know, it's unlikely we're going to see them running up and down Ripon High Street trying to market their wares. So for a while, likely to remain on a, on a large discount. And you have to wonder about the future viability of the fund and inevitably some kind of corporate event which will get investors out closer to NAV. But in the meantime, you know, if you can watch paint dry, and watching paint dry is one of our key strategies, you know what's going to happen in the end. And there's a nice lift waiting for us because this stock trades typically 23, 24, 25% discount. Right. So there's sort of two ways to win on this one, if you like. Yeah. And if you think of a trust trading at 75 pence in the pound and you get paid out a pound, 
you get 25 as a percentage of 75 on, on no movement. Right. But you're not certain it's going to be taken out or go out of business at this point. You're never certain, but you, it's difficult to see. I mean, hopefully they'll, they'll turn it around and, and find an audience. But there's so many funds like this that most investors will plump for sort of larger peers that are bigger and more liquid. So that's Aquila European Renewables. Let's talk about ECOFIN, US Renewables, ticker R-N-E-W. What are your thoughts about that one? Yes, another one that's had results this week. It's sort of trying to resolve the issues it has. I mean, uh, their sites were taken out by a tornado some months ago. Not so much a problem on their own particular site where the damage was limited, but the substation that it was connected to the grid was completely destroyed. So they're having to rewire it to another substation, which will take a few months, and they'll pay much smaller dividends as the one they announced yesterday for two or three quarters while they get all that sorted out. But, you know, they're very confident that they will be up and back paying 5.6 pence dividend per year. And we managed on the sell-off to pick up our shares at 56. So even I and my mental arithmetic can work out the yield on that one. But, you know, it'll probably be three to six months before we get the full payments getting reinstalled. In the meantime, again, because it's a bit smaller, this one's even smaller than the Aquila Fund, uh, they've gone into a strategic review, which means they'll probably be looking to sell down the assets I'm trying to remember what the nav off the top of my head is, but it's probably comfortably in the 80s, I would have thought. So, uh, again, trading on a very wide discount. I'm trying to remember the name of the site. It was something like Windy Ridge or or something like that. You know, South Texas, there should have been a question I was asking there. Indeed, they do have those kind of incidents. Indeed, they do. Mm. Uh, I thought it was called something like Hurricane or something, but it was anyway, it was quite... It, yeah, no, but it was something along those lines. As soon as I'm off this call, I'll, I'll remember it. Yeah, it was unfortunately appropriate. Uh, so this is a case of just bad luck as far as they're concerned? I think so. And also, most of it will be recovered on insurance. So it's not the disaster that the market treated it on when it reacted. But of course, there's an oversupply in all of these things. You know, an investment trust share price is decided purely by the balance of supply and demand. So if you've already got more shares around than people want and you get a few sellers re- reacting to that news, these things can fall very, very sharply in the short term. Right. And so the message is you need to be patient, as you say, as you are, and you yeah. need to wait for the situation to correct itself. But do you think there are some trusts in the alternative sector, which, you know, their NAVs are wrong, basically? I mean, is that still a possibility? We're going to find that out. And so in some cases, there won't be much of a future, even if the discount narrows it. Yes. Part of the reason that there's so many um, trusts sitting around at very steep discounts is that I think investors have been alarmed that the number of trusts that have run into very serious trouble very, very quickly. You know, Home Reap, as an example, Thomas Lloyd is another one where the board are, are sorting out some problems. Others are just too highly geared, like uh, DGI9, for example, good assets, but a massively leveraged structure. With high leverage, things can unravel quite quickly. So I think there's fear that there might be another one or two of those out there, which is, you know, that bit of fear is creating some cheapness around in a lot of trusts that um, are perfectly fine. I mean, when you work out the NAVs, most of them, like Aquila, for example, produce something quite actuarial. They're sort of working out theoretical cash flow for many years hence and discounting it back. But on some of these things, if you just took these to market and, and said, right, we want to sell this site, that site, and that site, what would you get? In many cases, it's, it's comfortably more than the stated NAV. So the NAVs, I think, in many cases, will differ from the true value of the assets. But I don't think it's, it's anything mischievous. You know, there has to be a methodology. And sometimes that doesn't always really tie in or give you an accurate figure of what you can actually sell these assets for. But then we have seen some cases of interested trusts on big discounts selling their assets or being taken out. But that's almost always, in the cases we've seen so far, being below the net asset value that was last reported. Yeah, I think in the first wave, you know, it's, it's things where things have gone wrong. Actually, it's both ends of the spectrum because it's ones that have gone wrong that need sorting out. But also it's the very high quality ones like Industrials REIT, which are one of our core holdings, traded on a 30 odd percent discount and just decided they didn't want to be structured as an investment trust anymore. What's the point? We would be better developing this business sat in Blackstone. And Blackstone bought the business out at a premium to NAV. So it's the two bookends, really, of, of situations that you're seeing the activity on early. But we are seeing, you know, active investors coming into the sector now. We've seen Saba come up and spend 900 million on bombed out investment trusts. You know, we hear rumours of two or three other activist funds coming in because, as I said before, uh, when you get a situation like this where perfectly good assets are not being properly valued by the stock market for structural reasons, the real world will come in and take them. Well, let's just talk then briefly about the property sector. It's not a one which you play a lot, I think, when you have some specialist interests there. But do you think there are going to be opportunities there for someone like you as well? You've mentioned Dusseldorf's REIT, but that's gone among the remainder. Obviously, you have your German rental property Mm, investment, which hasn't gone that well. Yeah, I think the headwinds are much greater in property. We wouldn't be sort of asset allocating any money to property because if interest rates are high, that's that's core to that business. There are some special situations. You know, Phoenix Free is one where the net asset value is three eighty three, but they've run into one problem after another, and the shares have recently got down as low as one forty nine. So there's plenty of room there to be selling down assets competitively in the market. 
bear in mind their portfolio is residential property in Berlin, which is a, an asset in chronic shortage. So, you know, you, you would have thought this would have done rather better than it has. But if you were selling at a discount to NAV and the data's NAV 383, you could take quite a savage cut and still give shareholders back 250 compared to a share price today, which has been down as low as 149 in recent days. So we do have a few special situations like that. But what we tend to be looking for is something where there's a good prospect at the macro and a special situation. And in the property, we've got a few positions, but we haven't got any that would come under, I would say, taking a, a macro view. They're all special situations and, and relatively small relative to the portfolio because you know there are still headwinds coming, I think, for the property sector. So let's talk next about private equity, mm-hmm. which has obviously, again, been uh, much influenced by people's expectations of interest rates and scepticism in some cases about the validity of NAVs plus issues around cost disclosure. Do you think the tide has turned in that sector as well? And if so, uh, you know, how is that going to play out? Well, I think they're all pretty bombed out and the discounts are wide. I don't think the worry about the truth of the NAVs is an issue now because once these trusts got past their December year ends, you've had you know big four accountants crawling all over these things who definitely want to be covering their backs on any valuation queries. So I think you know we can be relatively confident about valuations and, and the truth of the NAV. The other problem is given high rates of interest, then the uplift you're going to get, or that reduces what people can spend on acquisition. So when they're selling these things, they won't be getting the spectacular uplifts they had a year or two ago. But obviously, in most cases, are beginning better than NAV. The big problem is the cost disclosure, because the way the disclosure rules are drafted, these were probably designed for long-only equity funds. And once you start getting into real companies, the cost bases or the, the, the numbers you, you know, can be quite strange that get chucked out, sometimes having OCFs as much as 6 or 7%, which makes it uninvestable for many you know, fund of funds and model producers, uh, because they have to add quite high costs to the costs they have to declare for themselves. So you've got a significant overhang there of investors that need to get out of these shares. And, you know, Pantheon came up with a good move and bought back a lot of stock because that would have cleared the overhang because let's say it was 15% in that particular trust. Probably half of those are already gone, but the share price is not going to recover until all of those sellers are off the share register. And the well-timed buyback in the current you know market environment would be a nice catalyst to get that sector moving back to a more typical rating. You know, more typically over the years, you'd expect those trust to trade on around a 15 or 20 discount rather than 30 or 40 as they are at the moment. Among the bigger ones, you own uh, MB Private Equity. What's your feeling about that one? Is that one where you think there's still scope for re-rating? Or I think so, yes. Definitely. Why do you buy that one rather than some of the others, if we put that way? Well, the two we bought were Oakley and MB Private Equity. Oakley are just very, very good at what they do and great at sort of taking on businesses, digitalising them and, and, and selling them on. So that's more of a long-term quality situation. NB used to be a sort of fairly general private equity trust run out of the States. But actually, in recent years, it's evolved into co-investment. And therefore, it specialises in co-investment and and getting involved in particular situations, which is quite an interesting model. And I think what had happened was that it traded on the discount of its former sort of dull self rather than the current scenario, which was a little bit more interesting. And that's happened so often on, on trusts that they trade on the discount of the vehicle. or The discount is decided on the track record of the vehicle, not the team that's there at the moment. So NB had become quite a different vehicle, yet the, the discount hadn't at that time narrowed in or reflected the quality of the offering. Right. And so today it's trading on a water discount of about 35, is it something like that? That's typically where you'd expect it to be, yeah. And if they could sort out the oversupply situation, there's no reason why it couldn't trade on a 50 discount and make some progress at the NAV level as well. But do you think there's something for the board to do there? In other words, are they doing enough? I think so. I think so. I mean, it, it is not as simple in private equity as it is in, in equity funds, because you may have quite a lot of commitments. You know, Oakley, for example, has got an enormous amount of commitments, albeit to Oakley funds. Quite often, you know, if you get called, you've got to come up with the cash. And if you spent it on buybacks, then you've got a liquidity problem. So it's not as simple as it is with pure equities. But still, I think if you're going to resolve these discounts, you have to adjust and deal with the oversupply situation. And the most important driver behind all these discounts at the moment is oversupply. You know, I can't remember the exact figures, but I think, you know, in some old presentations we had, the trust sector is 182 million. Post the big new issue boom that we had, particularly in 2021, uh, that needs to be consolidated and, and probably needs to be a £160 billion pound sector to get share prices back into equilibrium with supply and demand. Okay, so if we look at some of the more, if you like, the kind of earlier stage high-risk investment trusts uh, mm-hmm. out there. So this week, Chrysalis has gone up quite a lot this week. That used to be one you owned. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, thinking about a slightly different sector, of course, RTW Biotech mm-hmm. Opportunities, which uh, this week has put out some news suggesting that it wants to 
basically merge or take over another trust. What do you think about those two situations? I mean, obviously, one I think you have been in, the other you're probably not in, or, or maybe, I don't know. Oh, no, we, we, we have a small holding in both. They're both ones that we're sort of incubating, shall we say. We think they could be interesting. And sometimes we just like to have a few shares while we learn about the situation, although we know a lot about Chrysler's over the years. There, I think, could be quite interesting because with all these early stage type investments, fairly soon you get to the point where they're going to be a success or a failure. And you can see in the Chrysalis portfolio, the top four, top five represent a very substantial part of the portfolio now. And if their momentum carries on, they'll be rising in value at a much faster rate than the, than the rest or the rubble, if you like to say, which is then by definition become much smaller and then carries on shrinking. You know, it has a much smaller negative effect than the positive effect, if you sort of mean. Unfortunately, the top four, top five, there wasn't much change in the valuation. There was a write down in one of the stocks further down the list. But we weren't really seeing progress in the leaders like WeFox and Starling Bank, for example. But certainly, we weren't being written down either. So I think on that one, we're, we're staying a watch. We've got about a 1% position. It trades on an enormous discount. And at the moment, the market still doesn't like early stage. But clearly, there's a hell of a lot of bad news in that price. And also, this is one of the sort of stocks that where people just want it off client portfolios. They don't really want to be talking about it, you know. And therefore, there's quite a lot of stock becomes available from people who are selling for non-investment reasons. And we always love it when you know people will sell a stock for non-investment reasons. RTW, very early, actually. You know, we were quite impressed. With, we did a meeting with them. We've been re-looking at biotech because it's had a, a really, really tough time. And, you know, their portfolio is a bit punchier than perhaps some of the others. And so I think that might be a valid strategy in, in biotech. But we've got a, a little bit of three biotech stocks. We've also got a little bit of Biog, which we've sold down in recent years because of the China exposure but also international biotech, which looks quite a solid way to play the sector. But uh, it's absolutely friendless at the moment and trading at sort of 20, 25-year lows. At a time when the fundamentals are actually quite good, there will be more drug approvals this year than almost ever before. So it's, it's really a case of a lot of biotechs are small caps, and small caps are definitely out of favour at the moment. So I mean, one or more of those factors could reverse. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's why we're in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is where instead of being patient, you have to be very patient is basically what it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so what about DJI 9? Do you have any specific views on that one? I mean, other than observing? No, it? not really. I mean, I think from what I've seen, I have looked at it a couple of times, but I sort of term ourselves allergic to debt because in previous crashes, you know, things happen very, very fast. And uh, once you've lived a few things like that, then perhaps you're rather nervous of high levels of leverage. I mean, the, the model for a lot of these alternatives is to keep issuing stock at a premium and then build out your pipeline. And they got into a situation where their shares had dropped to a discount, so they couldn't raise the money to um, complete the purchase. I think it was Arkiva. Therefore, they had to borrow it. And then they became quite highly geared. And then life started becoming more difficult. And you, you don't need much of a setback when you've got high levels of leverage to get yourself into a problem. And the problem now, well, while assets will be sold off, I suspect, they are seen as a committed seller, you know, one that's, that does need to sell. That will probably reflect the price that they will achieve for whatever assets they're trying to sell. So not one for me, I'm afraid. I mean, we just like to find stuff that's overlooked and unloved rather than possibly broken. <laughs> possibly broken, yeah. I mean, there are lots of issues around that one. And indeed, the second largest holding, the, the principals there are worried that if they sell off their best holding, then they'll be left with not very much. Yeah. Uh, that is a problem. Well, let's just talk then about some things that have been going Pretty well for you. I mean, one of those is uranium. You've been big mm -hmm. on uranium for a while, and uranium has done uh, very well. So are you trimming your position there? Have you, have you made all the gains you're going to make, do you think? or is there uh, A little bit. We've got two holdings. We've got Geiger Counter, which owns mines, and we've got Yellow Cake, which just purely owns physical uranium. And our sort of basic call was that uranium would get squeezed higher through a shortage as, as people return to nuclear power. The problem is it's not that uranium is a rare metal. It's the fact that it's been trading at $25 for years, post Fukushima. And there's no point in actually developing a mine at $25. You need more like $80. And therefore, no one's been developing mines for years. Now, suddenly, there's demand. Where's the uranium going to come from? So if, in the short, well, probably more medium term, there's going to be a shortage and that'll drag prices higher. In the very long term, as nuclear power becomes much more used, that time lag is less of an issue and the supply will, will increase to meet demand. But you will, you may well have a year or two when things get squeezed. And I think we've seen just in recent months, it's gone from 50 to 73. As Yellow Cake only owns the physical uranium, and we were sort of thinking the price could go to 80, there isn't that much more to go for. It does trade on a big discount and there is more to go for. But on days where it gets a bit frothy, we have let a bit go because we have got quite a bit of the portfolio in uranium at the moment because of the recent rise. Geiger Counter hasn't really been following. It's made modest progress. 
I mean, it's big two holdings, Kamiko and NextGen, have started to rise quite sharply in the last few days. So it does look a little bit left behind, even by its own portfolio. And you've got operational gearing in the mine. So the, the upside should be much greater on Geiger counter than it is on Yellowcake. And that's just not happening on the share prices. I suspect there might be a technicality because the Geiger counter shareholders have embedded warrants, which is warrants that aren't traded separately. And we'll have a call in a few months' time at 37. And people who've owned this have probably got quite a large holding because it's gone up quite nicely over a, a period of time. If they take up their rights at 37, that takes them to being quite a large, it's a one for five at 37. So there may be some people who are selling down Geiger counter to raise the cash, you know, selling, say, at 49 today to actually exercise their warrants at 37, which aren't saleable. If you don't exercise them, you lose them. So I think there's a technicality going on there. And therefore, that would explain why the uh, Geiger counter share price is badly lagging its own portfolio. And therefore, you know, we've seen the discount widen. Not so long ago, this used to trade on a premium. It's now trading on a sort of 21, 22 discount last time I looked at the screen. And then a couple of specialist country funds that you're invested in have sort of perked up in one case at least. And that's something about you have exposure to Vietnam and you also, I think, have exposure to an Indian trust. What's your story on those two? We also have Georgia Cap as well, which is a similar silver vehicle. I mean, Vietnam is probably a good example of looking for something that's got a good macro view combined with a special situation. And Vietnam, you know, our, our macro view is that the country will be a big beneficiary of the trade war between US and China. Multinationals are sort of hardwired into China for supply lines and manufacturing, but they would like to steadily diversify as that becomes possible. So, for example, Apple, when they were building their watch factory, decided to go and locate it in Vietnam. Could have easily gone to India or Mexico with the other two countries that are a big beneficiaries from that. So there's a big structural positive behind Vietnam looking forward. In the short term, Vietnam is very much exposed to the global economy, so any slowdown there hurts it in the short term, which providing an opportunity to get in, the market had a wobble last week or the week before last. You know, it's a, it's a strange stock market because it's 95% retail. And most of these retail investors deal on margin, which is borrowing money to buy shares. And as soon as they get spooked by something like a scandal in the property sector, as they have recently, and all start selling, then they have to sell more because they borrowed money. So they have to raise sales to pay off the borrowings. And therefore, sometimes out of the blue, you can have sickening falls in, in the Vietnamese stock market on absolutely no news. So we've had one of those episodes of late. But in the longer term, we think that the macro is a big positive. The special situation on Vietnam is that you could go back to, I think, around 2005. Briefly, Vietnam was the hottest destination on the planet. And there's some investment trusts launched at that time and raised absolutely insane amounts of money. And the legacy of that is that trusts like Voth and Vale are FTSE 250 constituents in their own right, dwarfing demand from UK investors for Vietnamese assets. So that's how it ends up trading on a 23% discount. But looking forward, I think our macro view on Vietnam being a beneficiary of the, of the trade war will gain greater acceptance, so there'll be more demand for VOF shares. And at the same time, the board completely understand the oversupply situation and buying in shares for cancellation on a regular basis. So you've got shrinking supply and rising demand, and there will be suddenly will be a tipping point, and this will be trading on a 2 discount, not a 23 discount. And hopefully we've done some nice NAV growth in the same time. And you know, it's the, the powerful combination you get between a rising NAV and uh, an houring discount it can be quite spectacular. And on India, obviously, uh, there's been very strong the Indian stock market and uh, everybody says yeah. it's too expensive, but it still seems to go up pretty much. And is that something you're yeah. running on the kind of macro ground? It's a very similar argument. The slight wrinkle there is that mid and small caps have been going like a train in recent months and uh, stocks like Ashoka and India Capital Growth have had fantastic runs. And the last time I was sat down looking at it, the mid and small caps have risen 20% over recent months where the large cap index had risen too. So it's an element of taking money off the table from mids and smalls and putting it into a large cap fund trading at a very large discount. So that's the, sort of the macro view. The special situation view is it, it you know, typically trades on around a 20 discount, but there are windows every five years. And if they underperform, they've got to give 25% back. And that's an NAV. So the new team that have taken over the fund probably came in maybe three and a half years into the windows, already hopelessly behind the figure. So unless it performs like an absolute train over the next year or so, then they're going to have to give you back 25% of your money at NAV. So that's really more like a 25% discount you're buying in at rather than the 20% discount that it appeared to be. So, yeah, a bit of a special situation there. And then we have been sort of shunting around our um, Indian positions. 
Well, finally then, Nick, obviously it's been a very tough year and you've not been immune from that. You've had obviously these successes which mm-hmm. we've talked about, but the trust itself, well, it hasn't performed as badly as the index, I'll put it that way, but mm-hmm. it has yeah. it is down over the uh, the last 12 months and year to date uh, because you've had the impact of discount widening, essentially. Mm-hmm. So where does yeah. the trust go next? I think we should mention, obviously, that the trust will be moving home, so to speak. It's being moved from premium item to uh, asset value investors who are very much also in the game of looking for discounts on discounts and special situations. What would you say to people who uh, follow your trust? You do have a big retail following yourself. What would you say to them? Yes, well, I mean, it's getting a bit boring saying we're less worse than everyone else because, I mean, you look at the decline of a couple of percent or whatever over the last year and then you look at the index and think that the University of Investment Trust has taken a, a sickening fall. So we've, we've dodged a lot of bullets, but hopefully we're moving to a more exciting phase. I think what we'll find, you know, as I said before, that if the stock market can't value things properly, the real world will come and take it. And, you know, we've already seen... Sabo, as I said, coming in with 900 million buying up bombed up investment trusts. But I'm sure there'll be more, many of them US activist investors piling into the sector and exploiting some bargains. And I think, you know, we're talking months rather than years away. I think this could all happen fairly quickly. So a lot of activity, a lot of corporate activity in the sector. So yeah, I mean, you can't, the discounts are so wide that they're not sustainable because, yeah, as I said, people will just come and take these assets, the ones that are good. And, and some tidying up of some of the difficult positions as, as well. So, yeah, no, I think it could be quite busy and quite exciting time in the coming months. I did read somewhere that you said that uh, this is probably the best time for buying into investment trusts that uh, we've had for a, a long while anyway. And that's because of these discounts, essentially. But yeah. you, uh, you stick yeah. to that view? Yeah, no, I think we'll look back to the autumn of 23 as being a golden moment to have bought into share, you know, bombed out investment trusts. I think there is fear around because we can't really explain how a share price can get so low relative to its perfectly decent assets that we can value. And so it's got to be fear that people are worried there's a, another DGI 9 out there or there's another home REIT. And that fear is stopping people from stepping in. And also the oversupply situation is quite extreme. And, and that is probably the most important factor behind these discounts. So uh, yeah, so, so we've, we've got to a position where the rest of the world has suddenly noticed the trust world and is about to arrive, a bit like the Vikings did many centuries ago. <laughs> Just before my time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, so the story is, uh, as far as the sector as a whole is concerned, less is more, basically. We want to uh, eliminate that oversupply situation by shrinking the sector. Yeah, the sector probably needs to shrink in the short term, initially by buybacks. But if, if trusts are fairly slow to get involved in buybacks, there is the risk that someone come and does it for them. One way or the other, the sector keeps evolving and has over the centuries. And um, yeah, this is the latest chapter. So that was Nick Greenwood, manager of Migo Opportunities Trust, uh, striking an optimistic note about where we are in the cycle. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.